French. Ah, the French. They got a phrase for it. As they do for most of life's eventualities, it is un embarras de richesse. Literally, an embarrassment of riches. And today, we are highly embarrassed indeed because we've got not one, but two stunning guests to you. Our first guest is serial entrepreneur with some planet-sized cojones. He's taking on Amazon's Goodreads, after all. Welcome back. Our favourite tech titan is Ben Fox. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. But that's not all. Oh, no. Oh, dear me, no. Our next guest is a Latopian, a multi-talented, Grammy-nominated trombonist and composer, leader of the critically acclaimed all-star horn band, Vinyl Hampton. Yes. Please give a rising welcome to Steve Weiss. Oh, my goodness gracious me. So much to talk about today. So, on to the first submission. And here we are. Who's it come from? It comes from Stephen. Not Steve, but Stephen. Hello, Stephen. I hope you're with us at the moment. If you are, give us a wave on YouTube in that uh, jolly old chat room there. Just say hello. It'd be nice to know if you are with us. It's YA fantasy. We love YA fantasy, actually. Everyone can do well out of that. And it's called, this is the title, Do You Like It, Genius Room? It's called The First Rule. The First Rule. And this is Steve's burp. Um, we cannot change the future, priestess, but I have a heart. And I cannot, in good conscience, allow you to go through this alone. Vanalia, a newly ordained priestess who serves the god of scholars and secrets, must solve the case of a missing girl to save the hometown that she was never welcome in, even though she's assured by a seer that doing so will result in her own death. Luckily, she already knows why the girl went missing, and it was Vanalia's fault. This is about our author, Stephen. Sorry, I call you Steve, actually. Some people don't like that. It's Stephen. I call you Stephen. Um, I've previously written several self-published novels, you say, including a full trilogy, and the feedback from agents was that I did not target a specific market that they could aim at. As a result, I've written the first rule to appeal to a specific group of fantasy readers. All right. But you don't say which group. I'd like to know, actually, please. Um, I have a solid and genuine following on Instagram and Twitter, or I post reviews of other self-published authors' work and often receive work from other sources to review, giving me a decent social media footprint. It's very good. I've been building this part of my work up due to notes from agents previously. Ooh, you take a lot of advice from agents, don't you? Um, that my online presence was lacking. Uh, do people say that? Publishers used to ask about that a lot. I think less now, actually. Um, it's definitely not a reason not to, to make an offer. I mean, that might be one issue, but it's not a deal-breaking reason. Um, and it's worked out very well, leading to regular, if low, sales of my self-published work. Let's see what we can do about that. Well, we're going to kick off and start today with this reading from Emily. The First Rule by Stephen. Read by Emily. Ten descended into the inverted world experienced veterans of many campaigns. Only two remain, Temple and Ungren, and they are fleeing for their lives. From the oily dark of the stone tunnel at their back comes the distant warble of a choir's song, filled with the voices of its victims, a mournful wailing following them like a predator. It wants them to sing too. The amber flames of their last torch flickers over the Ungren pallid, bearded face, the singing, as before, has frozen him to the spot, his skin grey and tired. I can hear them, whispers Ungren, the expedition's only dwarf. He strains, forcing the words out through trembling lips. It has me again. Temple, Temple, help. Pray, sing, Temple orders him. Occupy your mind. By comparison to the dwarven soldier, Temple is a wild wall of muscle. Eight feet tall, adorned in a warrior's breastplate the size of a door. He is descended from giants, but his size is not only his gift. Temple has dreams of his future, small snippets and moments. Remember, 
that there is something after this unwin, says Tempo. I make it out. Yeah, you make it out, says Ungren. I never asked to find there, in any of these visions. Tempo grimaces. That is answer enough. Aye, sighs Ungren. I thought not. I see only moments. There's nothing to suggest that you die here. About that, Ungren stumbles to a stop, and when Temple turns to pull him onwards, he sees why. Ungren lifts his shirt to reveal the dwarven chainmail beneath. There is a human handprint burned through the steel, leaving blackened steel where it is seared the metal way. Below is a wound, as though a burning hand has braided Ungren's flesh. From the handprint spread dark tendrils, an infection that pulses below the skin. They got you, whispers Temple. Oh, Ungren, when? Ungren is silent, eyes and focused, listening out for something. Do you hear that? Temple freezes, but hears nothing. Hear what? Ungren's voice is shaking. Temple, I can hear it again. I hear nothing. It's in my head now. I feel it. It is my son's voice. Temple, my son. Drown it out, says Temple, grabbing him by the shoulders. We haven't far to go. They freeze. Temple hears the singing louder now. It fills his head. Familiar voices, those of his fallen comrades, masquerading as his own thoughts, suggesting that he put down his greatsword, make his way into the darkness and join the choir, join his voice with theirs. Chills run over his body, the temperature plummets, and his legs lock in place. I can feel it pushing me down into the cold temple, he hears Ungren whispering. He seems far away, out of reach somewhere. It put its mark on me. It knows where I am. Temple, I'm so cold. Enough, Temple spits into the darkness, breaking the hold. I've dreamed unfulfilled. We do make it out of here. Ungren? Ungren's eyes have lost focus, as though Temple slaps him with a shovel-sized hand. Sing, Ungren, sing. You owe me a drink after all of this. Ungren nods, and together they run. For every step that Temple takes, Ungren must take four. I hate this thing, Ungren groans, limping alongside Temple. Why send mercenaries for something that an axe won't touch? Bloody magistry and their experiments, says Temple. I swear it's moving faster than it used to. The more join the choir, the faster it travels, whispers Ungren. I've been thinking that since it first attacked. It's getting stronger. We should never have opened that door, says Temple. We had a job to do, reputation to uphold. Ungren trails off, stumbling, slowing. Temple has to stop and shake him. Ungren's eyes are glassing over, his jaw hanging slack. It almost has him. Damn the magistry, says Temple, dragging Ungren along in a daze. And there we are, getting us off in style, I think, today, with Emily. And for Emily fans, and who's not an Emily fan, actually, when it comes to narration, um, also cake. <laughs> um, there's uh, good news, because Emily will be narrating the last submission today, too, uh, which is something to look forward to. Let's see what the genii are saying, if I can manage to summarise it, which, of course, I can't, because I'm not a genius, but they are. Lex says, quote in a blurb. Unorthodox, but I like this one. Uh, one or two comments on the title. Carol says, titles may be a bit too generic. I, I felt that a bit too. Vagabond says, uh, the blurb's a bit convoluted, but interesting. I'd look inside. And Matt says, interesting uh, title. Does the blurb set the stakes, though? Seems to explain what will happen. He does give a fair amount away. Uh, Vagabond uh, Hart goes on to say, title's too much a reference to Fight Club, of course. It is, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so title's simple, good, but something more attention-grabbing would be better. And I think that's a general theme, actually. Matt goes on to say, opening's a bit generic. I, I thought it was, too. Annie, first thoughts, prologue doesn't seem that unique present tense interesting says lex and he says characters feel realistic but wouldn't it be better to start with the main character um james says emotionless mm, okay well that's that's a big deal actually because we we need to get uh, our, our readers hooked straight away pamela joe competent but feels like tolkien fan fiction nothing fresh enough to grab me oh. um 
And Carol says, scene, scene includes intriguing elements. Johnny says, atmosphere feels a little dense and claustrophobic. This is possibly good or bad. Can't decide yet. And Annie makes a point that uh, absolutely chimes with me. She says, the te name Temple confuses me. Makes me think they're in a temple. Yeah. And James goes on to say, yeah, name Temple not working for me either. They're really getting fired up in the in the genius room. Like I <coughs> says, consensus seems to be some neat ideas, but not enough establishment and character to keep the hook. I agree. Find David in this marble. What a lovely way of putting it, actually. Hmm. Mm. Put you on the uh, on the on the hot seat, Ben. Uh, first of all, can you uh, cast your mind back and remember what it was like to read YA? Uh, yeah, actually, I love fantasy, so I do occasionally read a YA fantasy, although less now, but more so. But yeah, I'm a big fan. Um, I thought I thought the title wasn't necessarily the most grabbing, but it also wasn't bad. And if it had a good, you know, cover, I would it wouldn't stop me from picking it up. Um, you know, maybe there's room for improvement there. I thought the blurb was solid because it indicated you know it was going to be a bit of a mystery. Um, and then the real disconnect I had uh, was like a lot of people mentioned is that the opening um, didn't connect with the main character. Cause it made me think of Indiana Jones opening, yeah. uh, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, but that's all like kind of introducing you to the person who the book's going to be about. So it was a little confusing with temple there, but I thought the, the craft was great. Um, and it definitely sounded interesting to me um, as Good. a reader fantasy. Excellent. So you've, yeah. you've given the blurb quite high marks, uh, commercial appeal. Yeah. Uh, you've given um 60% there. So what would make you give it a bit more? Well, if the opener connected to the main character, I think that blurb, there's a big disconnect. You know, if the blurb yeah. had been around Temple and the girl, that would have helped me connect yeah. it. But otherwise, I'd, I feel a bit disconnected. That's great advice. Thank you very much. Uh, the genie, mm -hmm. I meanwhile... Oh, yeah, that, there's so much great stuff. I like the title, says PC Frontier. I'm not keen on the main character names, Vinalia and Temple. I'm not big on those names either. Temple as a name confuses me. Uh, several people have said that, actually, Stephen, so hopefully you can take that on board. Well-written YA is great. I'm a fan, says Kate. Or maybe I'd just like to kid myself on the young adult side, don't we all? Don't we all? Pamela Joe, Inverted yeah. World seems like something children world and close to Stranger Things Upside Down World. Yes, actually. That's a very good point, too. Thank you, Pamela Joe. Steve, it's your turn now. What did you think? Oh, boy. Yes. <laughs> I uh, understand why the Genius Room is called the Genius Room. Know, they made some marvelous, marvelous points. Uh, so, title, I gave it... Well, first off, I'm an easy sell. I'm going to love everything, pretty much. You know, I just enjoy reading. But uh, the the things that jumped out at me... The first rule, I liked it a lot. It felt it was compelling, uh, and maybe the Fight Club reference is a good thing. I it don't was know. a good one, Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could um, blurb. I thought was interesting and compelling. It makes me want to read it, especially that it was her fault in the end, even though it gives a lot away. So maybe it's doing what a blurb should do. I don't know. It made me want to read it, so I gave that good points. The uh, as far as the craft, there uh, for me, I love descriptive writing and i thought that stephen did a great job with that words like combination of words like oily dark and the sound of the mm -hmm. you know sounded like a predator and uh wild wall of muscle i love that kind of stuff that's good isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah as far as the bang i i love all this description uh descriptive writing um i also was not engaged and couldn't quite get myself into the mood of what was happening until for me until it got to the point where you said that's my son's voice and then i was oh what is this about yeah uh so that was interesting to me but uh uh yeah i'd like to know more so i suppose that's a very good thing fantastic steve can we just um make sure you're okay with the voting um you need to push the uh, i can't remember what the button says now it's such a long time oh the season. vote yeah vote. got it yeah there it is did it work yeah. Have you, you, well, it'll take five or ten seconds. Meanwhile, we'll check back in the genius and come back to you in a moment. PC Frontier says, too much use of Ungren and Temple. 
Some of these names can be deleted since it's obvious who's speaking. Who or what is bloody magistrate in inverted world? To me, these terms need deleting or explaining. Um, let's just see if our numbers have come in from Steve. They have! Wow, you've given very high marks to the title, very high marks to the blurb, not so high for the craft, um, not quite so high in the bank. So that looks a good start, actually. I mean, obviously it's appealed to the, to the YA inside you, Steve, has it? It it does yeah. it does you know it, it I want to read it so yeah fantastic good and that means Stephen not Steve but Stephen you got you starting us off with a very solid sixty eight and bear in mind our winner joint winners last month got seventy two so you was within a hair's breadth of that sixty eight very very good score um, we got a lot of talking to do on today's show we move on quickly. I think, first of all, we need to know what's going on in Ben Fox's uh, wonderful world of shepherd.com. Is there any contradiction at all, uh, Mr. Fox, and also being a shepherd? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Was it chosen because of that? Because are you having a bit of a laugh with us, or is it just coincidence? Oh, it's coincidence because I really like the brand it evoked of uh, kind of caring and, you know, caring guidance. So that that played into it. And then uh, I think it's a good brand name. So, yeah. It is. It is a good brand name. So what we want to do is to look at the latest and greatest things on your website. <coughs> um, we've got a big innovation happening there. Well, I mean, you, you told us last time you came on that there was going to be gradual but continual innovation going on Shepherd.com. And Shepherd.com, of course, is, is the probably the best book discovery website um, in the in the universe has ever been invented or ever will be invented. In fact, hyperbole. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so tell us, t what are we looking at here? Yeah, so we're we're finally starting to get genres and age data integrated into the site. And um, the first way we've shipped starting last week is we help people zoom in and explore like groups within a shelf. So this is a shelf on World War One books. So uh -huh. under what type of World War I book, you can zoom in on different genres, topics, or a specific age group. So you could find a YA book, or you could zoom in on, you know, something about the Western Front plus Amazing. for middle graders. Yeah, That's so it's, it's the first step towards exploring a bit more. I love it. Um, so and sorting will come next week. Yeah, okay. So let me just uh, move to that and... Uh, Rather inconveniently, I have to accept yeah, the conditions yes. there. Just done that. See, it's a yeah, live yeah. website, guys. This is it's not pre-recorded. Um, so, best travel books. I, I would love to know a bit about how this works out. So, who picked these books? Meet our seven hundred and sixty-six experts. So, just explain that to me, because what you're offering, it seems to me, is is, is a, a degree of granularity that we've never had before in, yeah. in a book search engine. Is that right? Yeah, so I've uh, basically over the last two years, I've interviewed uh, about 8,000 authors um, for, I've asked them to share five books around a topic, theme, or mood. And then, you know, using the technology, I look at what those books are about and try to build different paths between them. So if an author recommends the best books about the most important battles in Europe, you know, they might pick something from ancient times, World War II, World War One. So we find ways to help oh readers kind of navigate yeah. between all these cool points that make it fun. Is it always going to be a curator? I mean, you've got 766 experts. That's a heck of a lot. But is it always going to be curated like that? Yes, yeah, so it will always be curated on the editorial side. I think at some point we will also add uh, reader-driven favorites and we'll display it much differently than expert-driven because we use experts here, but... You know, some people within this are, you know, huge experts, like they teach at universities and leading yeah. universities where they've run, you know, we have Pulitzer nominated authors who've taken part. And then we have some people that are picking fiction books that had a personal impact on them, like um, All oh, Quiet yeah. on the Western Front, for example, on the yes. World War One section is a big one of mine. So, so we're going to mix that, but it's always going to be where somebody personally loved a book and a very high positive vote. Um, like we'll expand later this year to ask people for their three favorite books they read this year and bring that into this with a slightly different view. That's very cool. That's very, very cool. Okay, more from Ben, so, more from Shepard in a moment. Let's have a look at uh, submission number two. And indeed, more from Steve. Steve has got some very, very nice things being said about him. 
in the genius room. James says, I want Steve for my submission. Vagabond says, Steve is a nice man. Don't think I've ever marked 100. And Kate says, I'm booking Steve next time. I have a submission on. Very encouraging. They all like you, Steve. Oh, well, I love them. Oh, it's going to be a lovely show, isn't it? <laughs> Hugs all round. I like it. Let's have a look at this from Elif. It's from Elif. It's literary fiction. Oh, literary fiction indeed. Operation Mightily. Mightily. Have I said that properly? Almost certainly not. Sorry in advance for some some words in here I'm going to start with, to be honest. Um, Denise is once again spending a holiday in the Aegean town of Ivalik. The year is 1982, just two years after the military coup. An uneventful summer as any other. She spends her days cooking media pilaki with her yaya. Okay, I'm getting lost now. Resuscitating flowers that have been watered either too little or too much and stalking Pasha, the flamboyant superstar. But she will soon find out that her aunt is linked to a leftist organization smuggling political dissidents to Greece and her life will change forever. I've got some more difficult uh, words coming up. I think. Uh, my name is Elif. Um, I'm a Turkish writer, resident in the UK, who writes both in her mother tongue, Turkish, and her beloved tongue, English. My story is about the 1923 population exchange between Turkey and Greece. I don't know about that. I feel I ought to. Uh, and it's part of my PhD project at Warwick University under Professor Maureen Freely's supervision. A very famous name there. I think a translator. I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a translator. I live with my partner. Our song. You live with your song. What does that mean? Oh, it's a granny. Thank you so much, Vagabond. Thank you. See, that's why they call the genie. That's why I'm not. Um, and our sprocker in Leamington Spa. What's a sprocker? Genie, it's got a capital S, all right. So it's not sprocket, it's not sprog. It's, it's some sort of animal. Is it a cat? Is it? Is it, is it, is it I'm hoping it is. Because if it is, then I can press the kitty cat button. I don't think. No, no one's going to tell me what a sprocker is. Maybe it's completely unknown, except to Elif and Sprocker concerned. But what's not unknown is this rather amazing reading from the fabulous Mel. <laughs> Operation Mytilene, a novel, written by Aleph, read by Mel. Du plus loin que je me souvienne, j'ai entendu la mer. Le Clésio, le chercheur d'or. Prologue. I am standing at my hotel window, watching the last sunset on earth. The sun, a crimson memory, has vanished behind the misty blue hills. The tourists have long gone home. The sky is darkening. One by one, the cluttered gift shops are closing. Chaos prevails in restaurants, whose kitchens you wouldn't wish to see. Chefs are busy cooking the last supper on earth for those who plan to spend doomsday in town. The prophecy has it that our world will come to an end tonight, Friday, the 21st of December, 2012. Countries... Citizens, houses, castles, shopping malls, gift shops, barracks, hospitals, cathedrals and mosques, all will be destroyed, except for Syringa, a little Aegean village described in tourist guides as a lovely historic town dating back to the Hellenistic period, with unique architecture, beautiful landscapes, and friendly residents. Umad is stretched out on the walnut-framed bed fast asleep. I can see the tracks of tears on his red round cheeks, ripe like early summer apricots. My son cried himself to sleep when the wooden archery set got broken before he had a chance to play with it. As the sunlight leaves the room, I drape a blanket over him and stand there watching his trembling eyelashes, his pink lips, his hands resting on the sheets like two ethereal doves, and his lovely hair, the colour of the wheat fields of my childhood. I know that he wants to go home. He doesn't understand why we are here in this dreary place. Nobody had heard about Syringa and its history dating back to the Hellenistic period, 
until some Istanbulis came here to restore the houses, almost 90 years after its true owners, the Greek Orthodox population, left in the exodus that we call the population exchange. The poor migrants who were later settled here abandoned the tobacco fields and cut down the olive trees to burn them in their fireplaces because they didn't know how to cultivate them. The Istanbulis discovered the village at the beginning of the 21st century. They bought the ruined houses from their lawful heirs in exchange for almost nothing and opened the hotels. Then tourists started coming here, like grasshopper tribes, to see the Greek houses, even though the Greeks had disappeared long ago without a trace. They stayed here drinking corked wines and nibbling insipid mazes, prepared by migrants who'd fled from the war in the southeast, before discovering another lovely little village in the latest issue of the Boutique Hotel's Guide. I wonder how many of the hotel guests truly believe in the prophecy that the world will end today, four days before Christmas, triggered by the supposed end of the Mayan calendar. A few fanatics, perhaps. The rest will be fools with too much money and a poor idea of a joke. I am only here because I once made a promise to Alekos that I'd meet him right here when the world ends. I reserved this place months ago, even knowing that the odds were slim, he hasn't forgotten the promise we made to each other some thirty years ago. While I wait, I look through the mother-of-pearl chest. It once belonged to our grandmother Yaya, and it's been sitting in her old house in Kunda, untouched for twenty years. My mother and I had long forgotten about it. After Yaya died, we couldn't bring ourselves to rent the house out or sell it. We kept it as it was, as it slowly decayed around us. It was only last autumn when I decided to move in that my mother and I did some housekeeping. We gave away the time-worn furniture to an antique dealer. I stopped him at the last minute while he was taking away Yaya's precious mid-century armchair and the chest with the rest of the clutter. There must have been a mistake, I told him. These are not for sale. Fabulous reading. Our readers just get better and better. It's extraordinary. Speaking of readers, let me tell you about our narrators. You go to voice.latopia.com if you want to know what they look like, with the exception of Beverly, of course, who is um, hatted. <laughs> Seriously hatted there. In fact, I think we ought to put another picture up there. But I'm sure you can send us one. Um, but those are our wonderful narrators, and they are all available for your ex not exclusive, no, not exclusive, but for your use if you want to uh, get them to your audio book. So go there, voice.latopia.com. Let's see what the genie eye is saying. Um, Annie says, we, we start from the beginning, of course, um, from title blurb and everything else. Annie says, maybe leave out the uneventful summer part. That's the blurb. I think the blurb can be tightened, but sounds like my cup of tea. That's a good start from Annie, yes. Um, Hannah says, the only, and pretty much the same thing, really. Hannah says, the only interesting thing about the blurb was the two last sentences, and I, I agree with that. Lex says, I'm sure this book will teach a lot about Greek language and culture. Great for people like me, off-putting for others. And Matt says, I really like the idea of the story, but it doesn't come through in the blurb. And Hannah, of course, it would be Hannah, who informs me what a sprocker is. It's a springer crossed with a cocker spaniel. Very logical. Ah. Um, yes, a sprocker. Uh, and Johnny says, so the Stones <laughs> album was Get Your Grannies Out, which is yeah, of course, yes. <laughs> uh, Martin says, The Last Sense Out on Earth would be a great title. It would be, actually. I think it'd be a better title. I think that's a mm. great, great idea, Martin, yeah. Great first paragraph, says Annie. Agreed, Martin. Carol says, title sounds like a story about tactical military campaign. Sounds like action genre. Um and James says, I remember that doomsday. I think that's by, way back in 2012, wasn't it? Drank too much. Jolly time. Open tonight's hook, <laughs> says Matt. But keep up that tension. Lovely description here, says Hannah. Moving on a bit further, though. And he says, first paragraph was interesting. Take us back there. And Pamela just Pamela Joe says, oh, man, this is going to be tricky to, to write in the info um, without dumping. Needs more work. Ask what does the reader really need to know? Um, for this story. And Vagabond says, the idea that this is the last night on Earth is compelling. So I'm disappointed it's drifted into info. And I think that's the general feeling. Tension's gone, says mm. Matt. Um, this is towards the end. Um, in fishing terms, the fish is off the hook. And and he says, yep, still, it is the kind of book I pick up. I like the author's voice, but this opening needs some rethinking. Steve, can we rethink it? 
Oh, it's me. It's my time. Yes, yes I uh, I agree uh, once again with the genius room. I'm learning very every wise time to agree read. with the genius yes. room. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, I did it. I agreed in my own uh, very uh, off the charts positive way. But I've got some thoughts. The I would agree. The title is. I had a problem with the second word as well. It's kind of off putting. I'd have to yeah. look it up before. Uh, and uh, the blurb was interesting scene painting. Painting It made me kind of hungry. I wanted to eat something after, but I wasn't <laughs> especially compelled for the until the last sentence, and then that was a full grab. That was great. Craft, uh, spectacular first sentence. Holy camoli. That's what a first sentence. And it's I quite, agree. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. It was. It, I was like, what is this going to be? I love it. Uh, watching the last sunset or the, on Earth. Wow. Yes, and of course, yes. I agree that that is the title of titles right there. The last sunset. Uh, I it's agree. I, I love the the descriptive writing. Tears like early summer apricots. Wow. Once again, I was getting hungry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do that a lot. Uh, and then, uh, so I started getting lost on what seemed to be a very necessary backstory that started to lose me. It, for me, a little bit, the promise was so intense from that first paragraph that mm. I, I never got back to that. I, that I would thing. read it to find out if it does, but, you know. Yeah, that is the thing. Is that PC Frontier uh, sums up. It says, uh, Elif tells us that this is the last down earth. Uh, we all agree, really strong beginning. Yeah, the characters act as if it's not. Um, I think there could be a good story here, but it seems to be an awkward mix of non-fiction and fiction. And Johnny says, my new dog's a rotradoodle. <laughs> <laughs> Not directly relevant, but very interesting. Um, holy cannoli. <laughs> what are we talking about? I don't know what they're talking about half the time. That's because it gets straight over my head. Uh, thank you very much from YouTube, Kassan. <laughs> literary fiction is meant to wander through musings and emotions. If the reader wants literary, this book will satisfy that requirement. Thank you, because I'm very good to know that. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, so I, I love the blurb. Um, that really grabbed me. You know, I, I, I thought it had kind of a Tuscan, under the Tuscan sun or whatever type vibe, and then it got extra exciting on the last bit with the uh, kind of political overtones. Um, but I don't, uh, you know, reading that and kind of what that made me feel and think didn't match the title, because um, the title almost sounds more like a thriller. It does. Um, and then the, when I got to the writing, the writing, I mean, there were moments that I was like, well, this is 100 out of 100. It's amazing. But then I kept hitting things that just, like, slowed down, and I was tripping everywhere, like grasshopper tribes. I liked ripe apricots, but then in the immediate next line, it was, you know, wheat fields, hair, or something like that. It was just a lot of stuff okay. going on. And then the Mayan thing, you know, didn't make sense for the, the book. It just, it's like it, oh, it's off kilter or something's off a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I, I love the blurb and the concept. Yeah, yeah. And what are they saying in the genius room? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Jan says, my, my dog is a bassador. Um, Matt a bassador. A bassador. <laughs> Matt says, my dog has no nose. I know I know that joke. And Vagabond says, I disagree. It literally means wandering and music. <laughs> All right, so we've got a disagreement going on between YouTube and our genius room. Um, literally should mean the prose is as spectacular as the story another interesting definition there um mm -hmm. thing is if they're talking about dog breeds that's not a good sign actually what what we want them to do is to pay full attention to the manuscript and that really is our, our author's job to do that let's look at the numbers we've got numbers in from everyone i think now because 63 ellie so that actually puts you in the lead so far we've only had two submissions but 63 that's very good um, I thought it was very, very smooth writing. I liked your writing a lot. Um, like most people in the genius room, I felt that it was an incredibly strong beginning with a touch of eschatology. And it kind of takes us back there. If you're alive at that point, it kind of take you know, it, it, it immediately takes you back to that moment. And I just felt that it was sort of wasted after that, actually. You know, you've got a very strong establishing moment there, but... I just felt it meandered after that, and there's a lot of info dumping. And, uh, it's all been said by the genie, I really. Um, but thank you very much, Yulif. I hope. Are you, are you with us at the moment? If you are, give us a wave. We have a little chat in, in, in real time, live on YouTube. Very nice to, uh, to know you're with us. I think we need to know a bit more about Steve. 
Steve. Oh, my goodness. Hello. Yes, we want to know a lot more about you, actually, Steve. Um, well? We do, we, we do know that... Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to say one thing that just you are the, the problem with you is that you are a Renaissance Ooh. man, right? So you've got you do lots and lots of uh, mostly very creative things incredibly well. Um, and you know, you might actually a bit, a bit serious, right? You might actually find it quite difficult to to, to sum up what you do and, and who, who you are. But let me just let me just show one thing, all right? Just one thing that absolutely jumped out, and is this. Right, so oh. this is you, this is your. I mean, this is you know not the only instrument you play, but it's the one that you're most famous for. And you've mm. damn it, look at that! You've got a whole mouthpiece named after you. We've never That's had anyone on the show it? before who's had a mouthpiece named after them. How's how did that happen? I, it's incredible, isn't it? Uh, yeah, you know, and I, and I look at that as you know, if I think, gee, am I. Uh, being successful with any of this stuff, I just pick up the mouthpiece and look at my name and go, "Hey, yes. you did it! It's good. <laughs> it's you, good, good, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But how did it's, that happen? Uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, I, my trombone is a one of a kind, customized design by this fellow named Kristen Griego in Wisconsin. I call him Merlin, and my horn is Excalibur. So you can see a theme developing there. And uh, so we made the horn, and I said, you know, I love this mouthpiece that I use, but I'd love to tweak it and come up with something a little different. And so he is the person that makes my vision happen, and he created it. It's a, a Griego <laughs> mouthpiece. The That's the Isn't that cool? Thing. And I, I said I want it gold-plated. So, yeah. That's amazing. And Matt says, oh, actually, no, this is a top form. Uh, Matt says, only Steve and Sauron have that honor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who played the trombone. Uh, uh, Johnny says, yes, oh, but we, we have had several mouthpieces, Pete, on the show, absolutely. And Vagabond <laughs> wants to know, maybe you can tell us, Steve, who is the small boar one named after? Or was that between? Small boar. You know, it sounds like a, a, a wee pig in the woods, doesn't it? But it does, it's a... Uh, it? It, does. It, does. Uh, it does. Yeah. It does. That's it's the category. The category that is my mouthpiece. It's a small bore. Which I wish it was a large it. pig. That would be better. But. Yes. Well, we'll get into that in a minute. We've got one more submission to look at. Then we've got enormous numbers of other things. You met our two special guests. Now we're going to have a really good discussion between the three of us. But first of all, we're going to look at the third submission. Here we go. Sub number three. It's the coin. It's spec fiction. Speculative fiction. Very, very nice short blurb. And it's... Now, look at this. Is that a misprint? You're going to say, Peter, you've you cocked up here. You, you haven't got the name of the author right, are you? No, I haven't cocked up, actually, Smarty Pants. <clears throat> that is actually the name of the author. Lights Amidst Shadows. Lights Amidst Shadows. Isn't that the most extraordinary author name we've ever had on the show? It's a groundbreaking show today, I think. Um, I'm going to explain that in a moment. Um, I'm going to read the blurb. It won't take me long. How can a ragtag group of loners save magic from the onslaught of technology? Hmm. Right, now listen carefully. Lights Amid Shadows is a creative writing club for children and young people based on the town of Kazaniak, Bulgaria. How about that? Isn't that extraordinary? Uh, since 2003, they've co-authored nearly 20 novels with more underway. Between 7 and 20 artists were involved in each book as both writers and illustrators. Their trilogy, I absolutely can't read that because they're because I'm just no good at this kind of thing, really. <laughs> I will read the translation. Aurelion, Eternal Balance, placed 29th in the Best 100 Children's Books poll held in Bulgaria in 2011. Hello there! Well, that's fantastic. And Lights of Shadows are actually with us, at least somebody from Lights of Shadows, so it's brilliant. I'm so pleased you're with us. Um, they won the ESMF Debut Award for the show and a number of Bulgarian and other international awards, both collective and individual. Isn't that extraordinary? What an amazing submission. Um, deserves an amazing reading, I think. Yeah, from Jeff.
The Coin by Lights Admit Shadows, read by Jeff. Prologue, year 1007 of the Fourth Age. You, try to get to my himmel again, huh? A couple of clumsy fingers fumbled around the mud and plucked at the old coin. You're late. I've drunk it all. Waiter, one more. The young man slammed his mug against the board and the coin bounced up. A number of stairs tore through the curtain of cigarette smoke. A tiny kid sneaked under the table, scared by the crash, and peered up from there. He was watching the coin. Interesting, is it? Interesting? Look at this tarnish. Like I just dug it out of some tomb, huh? The kid pouted and hid. The waiter, a scrawny, crooked half-elf, brought the order and an oily grin. I hope you got some credits to foot your bill. Um, right. Wait a sec. Let me just get my wallet out. The scholar rummaged through the pockets of his robe, scratched the ballpoint on his crown, and peered around. Seem to have lost my wallet. <laughs> Look for it again. Please come back a bit later. He had a vague memory of someone picking his pocket while he was gambling with cobalt cards. It wasn't here. It was in the crypt of the Dwarven Bar, a block away. He'd left the place with a dreadful headache. Hope I paid my bill. I uh, damn it, did I? His head grew heavy. Smoke billed up from the pipe of the ogre opposite him. He took a sip of himmel, burped hollowly, and fiddled with the coin again. It manoeuvred between his fingers and sank into the grooves on the table. Was he supposed to use it somehow or hand it to someone? It was crucial, a matter of life and death, he said. Ah, oh, what a life. The kid cautiously picked up from under the table. His eyes followed the coin around. The scholar hiccuped and the coin sprang from his fingers as if it were enchanted. He leapt to catch it and sprawled on the floor. Hoarse voices rose from the neck tied tables. Baldy fell down. <laughs> Ouch! The scholar cried and shook his hand in the air. By Alia, watch your step. The waiter, having stomped on his fingers, jumped back. And you watch your crawl, grated the ogre opposite him and whapped liquor from his mouth. Who cares if you're a mage? You're so smashed, I'll crush you as easy as pie. They already did, my hand. The scholar waved his fingers in front of the ogre's face, sprawling on the table belly first. He couldn't recall what he was looking for, but there was a nagging sense he was missing something. And you... Why are you foaming like a rabid beast? Have you got something special with the waiter, huh? The kid from before sneaked under a nearby table. That brat, what about him? Oh, where's my wallet? Chapter 1, Log 1.1 for Neonius of the Hot Season. Son Rix, the Central Square, 1950. Lonely grey clouds shed tears over Son Rix although only a drizzle had dropped its earth uh, the street celestas to cover their goods. The energy screens on the central square poured out information about the air temperature, the exact time, the population of the capital, and tons of advertisements along the lines of Icarus Salamis made of the tastiest sour meat. Mafoli caught a glimpse of his reflection in the mirror window of a technomar. His hair looked as if the top of a palm tree had been attached to his head. What's the point of coming it at all? Striding along the obsidian tiles, he peered this way and that, fixing his green eyeglass on the building signs. How can I be so careless? Doc on us, demon it! He pulled a communicator from the inner pocket of his robe. He pressed a button and a hoarse voice came out. Mafodi, I need you, buddy. I'm in Spax Tavern. You remember it, right? I brought you here before. Oh, just come! Please, it's a matter of life and death. The speaker burst into coughing and the communicator fell silent. Mafodi grew as angry as he had the first time he'd heard the message. All right, it's judgment time. Um, let's go straight to the junior and see what's more. Um, oh, so many good comments here. Matt says the blurb is short, but it's intriguing. Uh, Vagabond says, ah, not a blurb. And I know Christina uh, Love on YouTube has uh, said that too, pretty much, actually. Um, a collaborative novel. 
I'm curious, um, says Christina also, is this a collaboration where each writer, yeah, I wonder, that's such a good question, where each writer contributes a chapter to write a complete novel. The blurb might better explain what's happening with the co collab. So we've got someone, haven't we, um, from Lights and Shadows right now. So can you answer that? Can you tell us that? Just type your response on YouTube. We'd love to know that. A uh, collaborative novel with so many young people involved. Wow, says Carol. Bravo. Blurb too short, says uh, Hannah. No idea what I'm going to read. Pamela Jo. Bold approach for the blurb, but I think misses the chance to sell the story to readers. Brilliant concept, says Johnny. Yes, great, says Vagabond. I think everyone's behind uh, behind this effort, actually. Um, but we've still got to be straight with you. We've got to be straight with you. Our hearts may be with you, but, you know, we've got to relate to the uh, to the words as we see them. Jan says, blurb reminds me of the writer's guild strike here, man versus machine. We might be talking about that in a moment, actually. I'm in, James says. Clever hook. I would open to read just to see what's going on here lex is, as a being of darkness says lex light amid shadows are my natural enemy i think i said that with a lex accent don't you uh matt says himmel is heaven in german read with real verve jeff says martin it, it absolutely was um is this middle grade says matt and yes that's a very interesting answer thank you maria yes each person contributes a part of the text and we all make sure it flows together how interesting we should get you on to talk about that. Prologue didn't do much for me, says Annie. Uh, good natural insertion of non-human characters, says Hannah. Taste of Sami is a brilliant bit, says Matt. Pamela Joe says, is it just me who would like a, a world that has a different set of characters than ogres, half-elves, etc.? And Wallet sounds a bit madman for the setting. Actually, I would like it more if they were wearing fedoras. And Maria con continues to tell us, every one of the writers is responsible for a character and decides what's ha what happens. How interesting. It sounds like a sort of... Uh dungeon type game in a way doesn't it um this seems more fantasy than spec fiction says hannah spec is generally grounded in <clears throat> excuse me a real familiar world and he says cool world building i chopped the prologue this didn't grab me says jan but i love the themes here carol says i'm sorry i'm confused who's he accusing of being late and of trying to get into himself uh, into his himmel <laughs> who's he talking to is the coin animated as if alive is the young man the same as the scholar? If so, he's young but bald. Oh, yes, this is the one that I'm reading. That's quite long. Is he a magician? Is the little boy important or incidental? Why does he have the coin? Interesting character and other details. I have no idea what's going on. And Martin also said something. I don't know if I can find it, actually. Yeah, Martin says, I think, uh, a really perceptive uh, comment. Lively prose. He says, lively prose, but struggling to connect with a character. Mm, all right, Ben. Yeah, so I, I uh, the title I don't think was necessarily bad or good, but it could have worked with the could work well with the right cover. The blurb I didn't like, um, in part because if I view everything cohesively, I didn't understand the big picture of the book, which I think is important if I'm going to buy it. Um, I thought the craft was wonderful, but. I finished reading it kind of with this like micro view of the book, but without the blurb, I was missing the macro view. Um, and that always is a bit frustrating because I know I need to read like three more chapters, maybe to get a glimpse of what this is really about. Um, so that's why the bang is a little bit lower is uh, I struggle to, you know, think about taking this one home, even though I love the writing um, and all the rest, but yeah. 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 Okay. So we've got our numbers in from Ben. I'm just checking that. We have indeed. Yes, you like the craft, actually. Good. All right. Steve, yeah, are great. you going to be nice to this one? Oh, I think so. Absolutely. Even right. though I, yeah, it's not all perfect that I want to say. And, you know, I do leaven my thoughts now a bit after hearing what Ben said. Initially, I thought, wow, this perfect blurb, compelling. It's like a jazz musician swinging really hard with only two notes. You know, it's, it was really kind of cool that way and less is more uh but i agree with ben now i would take a star away actually but um so anyway getting into the book i personally oh my gosh the reading this guy holy yeah i said that already i'll That's say great Jeff. googly movie oh yes oh great reading um and uh i love the viewpoint of somebody who's pissed drunk i mean you know and, and he nailed it i thought it was the you know the way he wrote it not that yeah. i had any experience well that would be jeff that. actually yes <laughs> oh <laughs> i see well he's he's 
experiential knowledge. Is I'm libeling yeah. one, one of our finest readers. I take it all back. I met Jeff the first time the other day at the Lit Fest. It was fabulous. And he's a very big guy, so I better not say anything about him that's unpleasant. He's a great person, and he's never known to take a drop more than he should. There you go. Well, I wouldn't have thought so. Uh, uh, so much action. I was enjoying the action until I realized I didn't know what was going on anymore. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then it got it got to the point where they mentioned the communicator, and I thought, oh, this is a nice kind of Robert Silverberg wrinkle, and I was interested again. So, yeah, I'd probably read it, but I wouldn't be compelled to. You wouldn't be compelled to. Fair enough. Um, we've got some numbers from you on that, have we? We have indeed, yes. You, you, no, that's interesting. The blurb has kind of divided people there. See, I'm a bit biased here, says Valentin, but I like the language use as a characterization tool. Why are you biased? Are you part of the collaborative? Are you are you part of the Borg? I want to know. Um, so we got we got a vast amount of difference here between uh, you and Ben. I'm I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Uh, you've given the blurb maximum marks. Ben gives, has given it very low marks. Guys, duke it out. <laughs> what? What? I, I, I mean, he said it's I, hard I'm because leaning more. Uh, yeah. Sorry, go. I, I would say if it was if, if I was using it like on an internet marketing bit, that can be a good mini blurb to lead them into something else. Mm -hmm. But the problem is with a book jacket on the back, that's way too short. I need more there to even then pick up and read the first few pages. Like I could see that working well in some marketing campaigns for now they'll read the next thing, but it was just it's a cool concept, but too too little I thought. Yeah. Go on. And I'm yeah. Easily, easily swayed by competent experiential knowledge, which Ben has. So I'm easily swayed uh, towards my initial reaction, which I just kind of went with. Well, oh, that sounds interesting. But right. uh, from what Ben's saying, well, I you voted up. Yeah. You can't change your vote. It's quite impossible. <laughs> Once it's gone, and it's done. And uh, just to point it out, actually, same country. I suspect. Thank you very much, Ben. That's great. Um, and the genii are saying. It's very interesting. See, Martin has actually revealed that Jeff only drinks baby sham, which is lovely. Yeah, right. yeah that's a drink that actually emanates from down here in uh, the West Country. Um, and James is not going to say who was tipsy at lit first, however. All right. Yes, fine. Yes. Uh, numbers. you got a 61. It's all tightly uh, grouped at the moment. Very tight bunch, isn't it? 61. Lights amidst shadows. I hope that you are happy with the 61. Um, the great challenge. I mean, I, I just what a, what a terrific idea, absolutely brilliant idea, and well done for for submitting to us. And I think everyone's heart is uh, is with you. I mean, I, what a terrific thing you're doing. Um, the big challenge is voice, isn't it? Really. I mean, getting one coherent voice, I think, is very difficult. Um, but there again, you're kind of solving that to some extent by getting, you're not just getting, I, as I understand it, you're not getting one person to write each chapter, you're getting one person to represent each character. So you might get a decent voice coming through like that, which I think is a, a brilliant idea. I hope you're pleased with that. We're going to talk um, a little bit more to both Ben and to Steve in a moment. <laughs> don't like that one very much. It's quite an unpleasant noise, <laughs> isn't it? I think we take that one away, shall we? We won't, we won't use that anymore. Guys, we need to talk about tech. Ben, um, is, is it a rude thing to say you might be a tech bro? Is it, how, do you, how would you take that if somebody said that to uh, you? Yeah, so as long as you tech guy, tech bro is kind of somebody that wears a uh, vest and is a real douche. So I don't, I don't know how to describe okay, that, but it's actually that. described as <laughs> a type. So yeah, you come from you come from the tech world. Steve comes from the uh, the creative world of of music. Steve, just tell us um, uh, in a sentence or two, basically, what has technology done to to music in your lifetime? Oh, in my lifetime, I've come from tactile to digital. And uh, I'm amazed that I don't even sketch music anymore on a piece of paper. I'm completely computerized, and there's many, many advantages. So from a composing standpoint and a practical standpoint, it's, it's wonderful. From the standpoint of putting uh, Brad on the table, uh, what's it done? A dystopian horrible, uh, horrible, to put it lightly. Uh, yeah. You know, it's not good. Was that was that inevitable? Do you think, Ben? 
Oof, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it was the goal of the, uh, you know, the tech outlook is very positive and that technology is going to help people connect. It's going to, you know, end war or reduce friction. It's done a lot of those, but some of the ramifications were uh, not as well thought out. Um, you know, some of the friction is actually what generates most of the money for the creative industries. Um, and that's, yeah. that's a problem. But there's always been gatekeepers. It's just now that gatekeepers have changed dramatically. And the way we've consumed media, books, and so on has changed so much that it's having to be redefined, and it's it's uh, not going well for yeah. some. I mean, I, I would say you're on you're on the side of the angels because you're actually helping authors get discovered, which is a, a brilliant thing to do, and which will help people to sell more books and so on and so forth. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I mean, am I am I at all controversial in saying basically technology has commoditized uh, creative output? books and music and stuff like that is turned into something you pay seven or eight bucks for a month certainly it has for music there therein lies the problem and i'm the the deceased canary in the coal mine begging you never to do that with the publishing world uh it's very difficult to get that genie back in once everybody can get it for free essentially ben? so uh yeah, it's a, it's a hard one. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. Um, I think the brands, there's a bit of a winner takes all problem, you know, with the uh, music and books and so on now where, you know, brands are being established and now they're being treated more like Marvel movies, you know, in the sense it's a land grab and they just keep renewing them. Um, but I don't know. I'm still thinking through a lot of the pieces there on, on where it goes. You know, it's definitely hurting new musicians and authors, but I'm not sure the slog is worse than it was back in the day. There just might be more people trying to slog. And I don't know. I can't quite tell yet. I can't That's get a read on it. Uh, so I think about a lot. Interesting point by Ben. Hmm. What, what do you think? Uh, you know, in general, uh, as you and I have discussed it, uh, what has happened to music is not yet there in the publishing realm. You know, yeah. so authors are in a really good place because you can make good decisions right now, I think. Somehow, this all overtook the uh, the music world, especially content creators. And by nature, we're just being creative and didn't watch as people took over. And suddenly, we found ourselves on the outside. So Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's what's what are your words of warning to the writing and publishing world? Because I do think I, th I I do think I do feel a sense of urgency at the moment with ChatGPT and indeed whatever Google is going to unleash soon. Because I don't know if you know about this, right. <clears throat> Ben, but um, uh, the next iteration of um, Google's Bard or whatever they call it will actually be connected to Google Books API which probably will mean that you can order up the next, I don't know, Michael Crichton book who died 20 years ago, but you'll be able to get some kind of weird synthesis, 80,000 words downloaded direct to your iPad. I mean, that's a bit of dystopian fantasy. It is. Yeah, and that's really uh, a problem. If, yeah, if you guys can can get better gatekeepers, you know, get somebody in charge of it better from the from the outset, so that where the problem is in music is that uh, $10, you get all the music that's ever been recorded, you yes. know, $10 a month, which is yes. great for consumers. I use it myself, but the content creators are left out in the cold with a, a slice of, it's, this is a real number, 0 0.0033 per yeah. stream, which yeah. takes millions to get up to the uh, poverty level. Yeah, most level, people are so. never going to do that. They're never going to actually earn money out of it, which is uh, disturbing. Right. Uh, do, you, do you think we've got a chance putting that genie back in the bottle? Ben, do you think publishers could could sort of say, actually, no more now, we're not going to be totally commoditized? Or what's your you know take on it? Yeah, I, I, it's hard because we've lowered the barrier to entry on both sides, music and books. Um, so I'm not, you know, I've seen some data, Jane puts out some good data too on, I'm not sure that the number of authors making a full-time career has really changed. I don't know yeah. how, if, what that looks like in the music world, but it might just be that we have a lot of people that can't get from step zero to step one, but we still have the same number of people, you know, going from step one to 10 and that's what I can't mm. quite tell yet. You know, I think Jane recently wrote something um, of hot sheet uh, and so on. And she recently wrote something using some data from different surveys showing that authors are, there are a lot of full-time authors and it hasn't really changed that much, but it's hard to see because we don't have perfect data historically. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. This is a real, this is a real hard one for me to see. Yeah. 
Uh, well, it's a but there's no, no putting the genie back in the bottle. There's not. No, it's, we will. AI is here. And it's, uh, well, maybe maybe you guys could do a better job of training the genie and uh, making him more knows? egalitarian. Who knows? Like, yeah, no, yeah, be, but, yeah, be scared because the models are all out in the open now. So, yeah. you know, anybody's going to be true. able to do what they're doing. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's more like, you know, somebody just invented this. And now everybody can get a copy and soon it'll be very easy. Yeah. The pace of innovation is extraordinary with uh, large language models. Uh, Hannah says, oh, I've just subscribed to Shepard.com. Um, and oh, Johnny says, I, I can now use the BBC Symphony Orchestra on my laptop. They're coming for books now. Um, Scat GPT suggests, Matt, that might be next. And Johnny says, what does Steve feel about sound, sound libraries for digital composing? Strings, horns, guitars, whatever. What do you think mm. about that? Well, I'm conflicted because I love to use them as a composer. It makes my music, my demos sound better. Yeah. Uh, but then I always think of the, the poor soul that sat there all day long recording all that, all those textures from their instrument, and now it can be used. You know, yes. I yes. wish there was a better way to pay for it. It's like Clyde Stubblefield, the great drummer. His uh, funky drummer track is the most used ever in, in, in rap tunes and things, and he never oh, really? got paid for it. Is it? Yeah, is it? yeah. Oh my goodness! It's it's amazing. Yeah. So there, I wish there was a better way to pay for it. But yeah. personally, I use those libraries. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so much more to talk about. Oh gosh, I want to talk about Substack and all kinds of other ways of making money technologically for authors, maybe unconventional ways, but we can't because we've got one more, two more submissions to look at. And here we are. Submission number four. It's from Andrew. Hello, Andrew. I hope you with us. Give us a wave if you are. Historical fiction. Very straightforward genre there. You are with us. That's very nice to know. Yes. Very uh, upstanding fine young man you look indeed. Yes. This is Andrew's title. The Melon Seed. Now, I like that. I like that title. It's a little bit low key, I'm assuming, but I like the title. I think it would stick in my mind. That's kind of, you know, the hook test, really. Does it stick like a fish hook in the brain? And that would stick for me, I think, yeah. Historical fiction by Andrew. This is Andrew's blurb. Stephen's comfortable, empty existence is transformed by an unexpected visitor from his past. Forced to face up to the consequences of a love he had long suppressed, he's drawn back to his time teaching in Beijing. China during the spring of 1989. There he toyed with the people and events associated with the pro-democracy movement, only to be bound up in both. Despite venturing as far as the plains of Inner Mongolia, he was drawn inexorably back to Tiananmen Square on the night of the 4th of June. Dr. Grant as a teacher and traveller. He spent many years organising and leading month-long overseas expeditions for young people. He has been fortunate to be on the fringes of various world events, from the fall of communism in the Soviet Union to the civil war in Nepal. The Melon Seed is his fourth novel and is based closely on his time teaching in Beijing, China. Via his agent, the book has received praise from publishers including Penguin, Hodder and Bloomsbury, but no offers to publish yet. All right, so a completed January. So... When you're sending in a sub, I mean, that's interesting information for me, but when you're sending a sub to other agents, I wouldn't say that it's, it's you know, the other, for whatever reason, doesn't matter what reason, uh, that, you know, major publishers have already seen and rejected it, because that is going to be the kiss of death, actually, because the agents just won't bother anymore. They won't bother, actually. So I don't mention that, generally speaking, just a little tip. Um, but I am actually really delighted to tell you we've got, an amazing reading, it is an amazing reading, from the one and only Martin. The Melon Seed by Andrew, read by Martin, for Lynn. Wheresoever you go, go with all your heart, Confucius. But the great Khan was informed by his astrologers that this city would prove rebellious and raise great disorders against his imperial authority, Marco Polo. One, England, summer, 2022. The here and now has been a long time coming. I thought that it would never arrive, but then it was with me as though it had always been. The first flush of spring, bright and fresh, 
and unmistakable. I have felt as old as Confucius, but a thousand-year-old seed is still a seed. My sigh of relief throws through these words. I sit at my desk, looking out upon the new season, and wondering how I shall tidy up the winter debris. But it does not matter, for there is time, time where none would wait before. A child skips unhurriedly over the lawn. Both she and I recognise that this is how it was meant to be. I have faith in the past. I know that it will begin to make sense. That is why I am writing. I have a tale to tell. I must retell it to myself, pick the memories from the discard pile and see how they wish to fit together. Nothing, once broken, can ever be as good as new. But that does not matter, for this is no longer my story. This is for the child who so lightly troubles the grass, who turns and grins and effortlessly paints her magic upon my face. I am nostalgic for the future, as I know it can never be mine. I am hopeful of the past, as I shall dig within its graveyard of dreams. And as for the present, I need only return a smile. Chapter 2, May the 15th, 1989. I barely heard it, but the sound has never truly left my head. That low rumble with a metallic edge. It was easy to distinguish the noise from the usual convoys of diesel-bound trucks. It wasn't loud, at least not to begin with, so it didn't rise above the excited chatter of the crowd. I wonder who first heard it. Not me. Almost everyone else had fallen silent before I came to notice. Perhaps it changed their lives too, a pivotal moment when a random collection of experiences coalesced into something dangerous and new. I'd been feeling very relaxed, my legs stretching down the steps of the Monument of the People's Heroes in Beijing, China. My friend Chen was talking to me in his usual reverential tone about the protests, while I bathed in his casual adulation and my newfound sense of self-importance. History was being forged by the students of this city, and I had a ringside seat. It was my second visit to Tiananmen Square within the week. On the first occasion, we had stuck to the boulevards, hardly pausing to take in the loose collections of individuals milling around the vast central expanse. It had appeared as though they, they were lost within all that space, still looking for a cause to follow, like a newly arrived festival crowd, randomly checking out stalls and stages. We had turned left in front of the walls of the Forbidden City, which glowed the colour of overripe oranges, and headed down the very road from which the clatter and rumble now came. I could still clearly picture the lines of buses and barricades thrown up at regular intervals across that broad avenue to discourage the troops. Not that these soldiers had shown the slightest interest in taking on the crowds. Chen noted that some had been actively shouting their support. Later, he told me that several of his student friends had brothers and sisters in the local army regiment who wanted to join the demonstrations. I remember something rather quaint about the barriers. They stopped before the sides of the road, allowing the usual blizzard of bicycles to pass through virtually unimpeded. Anything else could have driven past too, but nobody appeared concerned enough to do anything about this obvious defensive flaw. There was a ritual aspect to the process at that time, so the barriers and the commandeered buses which also blocked the boulevards were a form of art installation. Thank you, Martin. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant reading, as always, but it really was. Uh, so much to tell you about the Genius Room now. Uh, just um, before we, we start this, uh, Pamela Jo has got something interesting and relevant to say, I think, to, to Ben, actually. Substack needs Ben's approach. It does. It totally does. Uh, too, uh, Pamela Jo says, too hard to find something you want to read. Right, absolutely. Get Ben cracking on that. 
Uh, I like the title, says Hannah. Mm. Martin says, am I sticking your throat too, Peter? Yes, you're right. Fair enough. Thanks, Martin. And a nice title. Blurb has some good themes, but we need more specifics. Who is the visitor? Title could work well, says Vagabond, with an interesting cover. Uh, Melon Seed's lovely title, says Carol. Sounds literary, hints at symbolism, deep meaning. I agree, yeah. Um, as he, he, he toyed with sounds kind of creepy. Uh, I'm not, not sure what that comes from, but I think it's poss possibly... <coughs> I think it's maybe aimed at Steve, I don't know. Um, oh my God, says Hannah, 1989 is historical fiction now. Yes, it is, actually. Um, Pamela Joe says, oh, I like this. 1989, a real liminal year. I can never forget Tiananmen Square. This blurb would have me. The title is self-explanatory. I love the title blurb too, says Jan. Chapter one feels like a prologue, says Carol. Perhaps called chapter so it won't be skipped over and hannah says maybe only one quote would be better yeah i think too many quotes that definitely and johnny i'm mixed feelings of literary quotes to kick things off for sure if published otherwise yeah great line i felt as old as confucius pamela joe loves that this is great prose for me slow but poignant martin on narrator's powerful voice not keen on the formatting says hannah and that's right it's it, you need to basically just say i did this free video didn't i have can i show you about that um, I don't think I, I don't think I've got it here. Actually, it's, uh, I haven't got a card. If you just look on the um, uh, Latopia channel, there's, there is a, a, a free video about uh, formatting. Um, so the last kiss in Chandler Square. Yes, it is a good comparator, actually. Mm. Wow! How can I summarise everything that Gene and I are doing? I the best thing to do, actually, um, Andrew, is just to sort of freeze frame and you know just read what you see. Self-indulgent and unnecessary first chapter question mark says vagabond chapter one could be cut says hannah we're getting a bit of reaction about chapter one i think it's fair to say opening writing the perception expressed is quite beautiful says carol even beyond the ordinary but it's such an introspective and philosophical start the best hook for historical fiction readers question mark beautiful says martin mm. on narrator beautiful poetic prose sense of something bigger this reads like a prologue. I think we made that, says James, and I think the genie I have decided on that. Annie uh, always uh, uh, bangs it on the uh, nail on the head there, says Annie. Uh, I never known to get it wrong, actually, but then the genie I don't either. Annie says, chop chapter one, start with chapter two. That's good advice. The writing comes to life when we get out of the author's head. Um, I need a hook before the perhaps, 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 says Hannah. Um, and moving on. I hate to say this when it's based on the author's experience, says Annie, but I don't like the main character. Feels a bit pompous. Ooh, yes, well, we need to deal with that. Anyone who recalls or knows of what happened at Tiananmen Square will sense the ominous threat of a low rumble with a metallic edge at the start of Chapter 2. It alerts the reader with immediate foreboding. Steve, how did you react? Uh, similar in many ways to the to the genius room the uh, the title I also I love I agree with you on that it's very interesting and it is quite sticky I, mm -hmm. I love the title uh, the blurb wonderful opening sentence with a good cliffhanger at the end maybe a bit long it, here's it's time for a plug I would suggest to check out Peter's uh, blurb video which is now yeah. a canonized <laughs> gospel in my prose Bible. It's, uh, it's Same feature in that wonderful. <laughs> yeah, hey, that works. Uh, uh, opening quotes, I love those in a book, and I love historical fiction in general. It, it, for me, it was the, uh, the contrast of what I thought was absolutely stellar craft. The prose, beautiful. I mean, give me a break. The child who so lightly troubles the grass was wow. isn't that great that's a lovely, lovely then, line yes it is i yes. absolutely love that it's, mm. it says a lot to me the uh the bang for me didn't follow up the 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 beautiful prose was the only thing so i think it could be more compelling and dig dig deeper i wasn't quite sure of the hook mm. yeah so I'm um, being promoted from vicar to saint now, apparently. <laughs> oh, I expect <laughs> canonization isn't that bad thing, I think, actually, as long as you're alive still. Pamela J says, the wire cage yeah. trash trucks full of young prisoners bound on their way to death or slavery in prison. I could never shop at Costco knowing that most of the early products were handmade by the prisoners of that lunge for democracy. 
Wow. And I said 700 words in where we didn't have a real grasp of the story or rather it hasn't grasped us. And Andrew actually on, on YouTube did say, oh, yeah, I was pompous. <laughs> okay, so if you were, we need a bit of introspection, I think, actually. So a, a knowing nod to the reader saying that, oh, that was me then, but, you know, I've been changed. I think if, you, if, you, if you're getting that negative reaction, okay, so Christina says, well, maybe pompous is good if going for reaction and then might much to a character. What well, much? Does that mean much to a character arc? Yes, we've got to have that indication, haven't we, that there is an arc going on. If, if, if not, then you're going to get a few negative reactions as you have done in the uh, Genius Room. Ben? Yeah, I, I love the title. I thought the blurb was great. Um, I read a lot of historical fiction and uh, I definitely would have picked it up. Um, I think like what everybody else said is I, when the, the first chapter finished, thank God they read the second because I was like, what yeah. book is this coming out of chapter one? Yeah. Um, I, I think maybe chapter one could be used to uh, show that character arc. I, I especially love in books where they kind of talk about their younger self as a bit of a flashback because I find that I, I love books like that because they help me also look at myself. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought it was great, though. But, yeah, chapter one, I would definitely, I don't know, throw away. It was beautiful, but it just didn't seem to fit and uh, try yeah. something else. But I like chapter yeah. two, and the wording was great. Thank you very much, Ben. Genius it just keeps on coming and coming as the gift keeps on going. Peyton says, evocative title. Very good advice, Peyton. Thank you very much. It's an important point. Evocative title, but melon seeds are in Minecraft. I didn't know that. Uh-oh. So the reference will confuse yeah. games. All right, so be aware of that. And he says, oh, got slight, slight, uh, oh, yeah, regrets here, actually. I don't know I should do this before. Maybe I was a little harsh, says Annie. The writing is good. I'm just short on coffee, that's all. Hey, hey, that's fair enough, you know. I mean, readers are often short on coffee. Vagabond says, but he's writing from the now, not the then. So the pomposity should have gone. Very good point, Vagabond. Very good point. Yes, all right. And the numbers are looking... <gasps> yes, you have a good score, Andrew. And I think I mentioned to you that the two joint winners last month got 72 each. So I would say you are in a commanding lead with that. I hope you're happy about that. Are you? Let us know. And Martin said, wasn't Melon Seed in the Spice Girls? I don't think so. I don't think there's someone. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know who he was. How do you remember the Spice Girls, Martin? Heavens above. Dear me. Oh, David's nervous. Good, we like that. Hide behind the sofa, David. This is the wrath of God about <laughs> you, I think. No, it's not. There's a QR code there. We've had a few QR codes. I haven't um, mentioned them, but you can scan them if you have nothing else to do, or even if you have. Oh, thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Not at all. Not at all. Um, so scan that and see where uh, David wants to take you. This is fantasy. Mm. Nice way to end the show with some fantasy, isn't it? It's called Centuria. Do you like that title? I want to know. Do you like the title? This is David's blurb. Born into the lowest cast in the empire, Giala was raised to be deferential and obedient. Her violent temper gets in the way of that. Conscription into an order of female bodyguards. Oh, sounds like North Korea, doesn't it? <laughs> Saves her from life as a courtesan, but it is still a life of servitude. Giala hates risking her life to protect an imperial clan full of schemers and murderers in North Korea. Her loyalty is to the women she serves with. As she rises through the ranks, she plants the seeds of a mutiny that could bring the Empire to its knees. Mm. Uh, about David, who's with us. Um, I earned a bachelor's in creative writing from Antioch University and a master's in English education from Wright State University. I'm a teacher and a world traveler. Wow, just like uh, um, Andrew, actually. Interesting. Um, it's funny how these things work out, actually. We don't, we don't sort of, you know, Stack the deck at all, just as it comes. Um, I'm a teacher and a world traveller. Traveller has lived in China, Korea, and Cambodia. Oh, and Korea. All right. Um, I've also worked as a freelance writer in the tabletop role-playing games. 
Mm. And educational publishing industries. Wow. Well, I did promise you, didn't I, uh, a twofer from uh, Emily. And I'm delighted to say here she is for her second reading of today. Centuria by David. Read by Emily. Guyala shivered and sniffled beneath her threadbare blanket using the thin cloth in a vain attempt to fend off the chill of the night. The rickety one-room shack where the servants lived was draughty, and her straw mat did little to fend off the cold from the earthen floor. She was certain her illness would get worse. Guyala's trembling hands made it difficult to finish braiding her new bracelet. It was a simple thing, crafted from bits of twine swiped from the weaver woman. She could have stolen dyed cords with their beautiful colours, but such bright hues were not fitting for one of her kind. As she worked, she examined the fresh tattoos on the backs of her hands. They were still red and swollen from her marking day, thirteen years of life commemorated with needles and ink. Diala glanced at her mother's hands as the older woman drug herself across the floor to prepare the shrine for their evening prayers. The cast marks adorning her mother's rough skin were indecipherable. The lines blurred, and the ink faded from the sun. Not that it mattered. Her mother's cast could be seen without reading her tattoos. Her downcast eyes and deferential demeanour were instant giveaways. You've been fighting again, her mother said, looking at the girl's swollen bottom lip. I didn't start it, Guyella insisted. Oh, it's never your fault, her mother said, sighing. Someone called me a name, she said with a shrug. A boy or a girl this time, her father asked from his mat his words punctuated with a weak cough. A boy, of course, Guyella gloated. The girls all know better. The toolmaker's son caught you staring at his bow again, her mother asked with a voice full of iron. Guyella was about to give an angry denial, but stopped out of respect for her mother. She had to bite her tongue more often lately. Minding her place had become difficult. She returned to her braiding. Someone banged on the wall. It was the mistress of the house. You haven't emptied this cart yet. It's been days, she said. It's overflowing with filth. You won't eat for a week if I have to smell it for another instant. It was her older brother's task to drag the rotting kitchen scraps and other waste to the far side of the estate to be fermented beneath the fields. Unfortunately, her brother and father had fallen to the fever ravaging the estate, disabling servants and householders alike. Can't wait until morning, Guyala asked hoping the high-caste woman could not hear her. Her mother shot her a disapproving look. They could not argue with someone so high above them, even if she was being unreasonable. Guyala kicked her father and brother mercilessly to rouse them for the chores. You heard her. Get up and do your work, she commanded. They moaned and argued about who should rise and remove the waste. Guyala looked at her mother. She could not do it. The other servants in the shack stared at her coldly. They were not anuhai. The chore fell to Guyala, though the fever had begun to work its way through her as well. Groaning, she set out. Guyala trembled as she pulled the overburdened cart along the uneven path. The night air chilled her sweaty skin. Step after torturous step, she hauled her rancid cargo towards the compost pits. The cart was meant for a smaller person, but the girl had to stoop to keep it level adding insult to her aching back. She blew uselessly at the strands of long, dark hair falling across her face. Her only companion was the sound of the wooden axle grinding against its iron retainer. The clouds hid all three moons and left the wooded valley covered in an impenetrable shadow. She heaved the heavy cart forward, bit by bit. Every bump and rock caught the cartwheels like an impossible mountain peak. Her heart jumped at the sound of rustling leaves. She froze. Her eyes frantically scanned the night for any sign of dark spirits. Her breath quickened as she recalled her father's stories about the shades and wraiths living in the mountain wilderness beyond the estate. Thank you, Emily. You get paid twice for that. No, she don't. You think anyone get your money for it? Sorry. Um... <laughs> But you deserve to. Yes, let's have a look at the Ginny 
Vagabond says, yes, I do quite like that title, Pete. Thank you very much. I asked and I got the answer. Uh, Carol says, title could perhaps better reflect story about a strong female. Yeah. Yeah. Blurb needs to be uh, pared down, says Lex. Has some great stuff. Let's go. Uh, proper blurb. Well done. I pick it up, says Pamela Joe. James says, blurb hooks me. Good. Blurb indicates feminist coming of age story. Is story YA, says Carol. Hmm. I wonder if it is. Cool and solid blurb, says Annie. But where's the fantasy? Well, the fantasy is coming. Um, reminds me of She Who Became the Sun. Oh, yeah. Johnny says, almost have a, has a swords and sandals genre feel. Great opening paragraph, says Annie. That last line about an illness is a noise hook to keep us radio. I need a gradient hint of fantasy, says Hannah in the blurb. Several people have said that. Just show behaviours. Don't need to then explain them, says Carol. Readers get it. Title means nothing to me says Pamela Joe, the story sounds very much like a recent film about African women warriors. Women bodyguards have become a bit of a trope for the erotic frisson. Um, see John Wick 4, not crazy about using this for fantasy. OK, interesting. Think that through, actually. Hmm. I like the writing, says Hannah. It's drawing me in. I feel like we're getting a nice voice coming through here, says Matt. Though, always is the case that they're, with them, it's really that's absolutely right. That is so true, actually. I have to divorce that. In fact, sometimes I, I don't listen when I'm looking at the, at the piece. I just, you know, I just look at the words. Um, Vagabond says, after all the promise of the blurb, a girl being told off by a mum seems a bit of a time opening. Competent writing, but feels a bit generic, says Johnny. What did you think, Ben? Well, you've lost your audio. Well, I don't know why. Sorry about that. No, oh, my God, yes. <laughs> I you. muted. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, no, I love the title and the blurb. I thought they worked really well. I brought up um, kind of some feelings of uh, the Roman Empire, which I'm assuming maybe was the uh, the purpose there. And I thought the blurb was fantastic. Just everything in one go. I knew what was you know coming and so on. Yep. Um, I love the craft. I want to hear more. Um, and I thought commercially it sold well. I think the only thing I stumbled over was um, – this character, although maybe it's, you know, hinting at her personality of the line about her uh, kicking her father and brother mercilessly, mercifully or mercilessly. Yeah, know, something like that. I'm messing that up. But yeah, yeah, I was like, wow, that's that's pretty uh, hardcore for, you know, her personality development of hard to be sympathetic to a character like that. And then mm -hmm. I also was left questioning, you know, why is this cart so small? Is it for her? You know, like, was, was her brother really small and her dad really small? Like, something that just caught me. But otherwise, I thought this was fantastic. And yeah, wow. I, would, I would read it. I would take it. Look home. at those numbers. Yeah. You absolutely do. That's brilliant. Yeah. And you actually, actually, I mean, you've said this to us before. You are actually quite a, an avid reader in this show, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's very great. Much. Fantastic. So, David, you've made one sale at least. Let's look at the junior eye. All the right ingredients, says Annie. But is this the place? Mm. Is this the place to start? And how often do we do we say that? Vagabond says, "Yeah, don't just think this was the place to start." And Matt says, "Not enough story to grab us, but the voice is there." And Carol says, "Maybe a bit more underlying teenager versus parents conflict and dialogue to enliven it." Um, that last paragraph was good, says Annie. Maybe move the opening forwards. Just rewrite cart pulling, says Carolyn Forrest, to create even more tension and suspense. And PC Frontier says the writing's <coughs> reasonable, but a bit of a dull domestic start. I thought that too, actually. What's a marquee for this book? Teenage girls? Question mark. Chandler Jewell says title too vague. Interesting worldview. Solid craft. And is more of a hook. And uh, Annie is assuming it's adult, but we don't know. We need to be told that. And Jan says no offense to the writer here, but why does fantasy so often give us a big, fantastical world, but women are given limited choices within that world? Is that is that the case? Um, warrior slash god or prostitute slash courtesan? I can't the same things, aren't they? Really, I think they are. Oh. I don't know. Are they? I don't know. Steve. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, I, you know, the title, I'll just go through it real quick. I mean, I enjoyed it. And, and look at me. I'm the mean judge this time. I can't believe it. Uh, I'm so easily swayed. <laughs> Every time I hear Ben, I want to change my mind. He's, uh, I'm so easily swayed. He's very persuasive, isn't he? Uh, yes. Very <laughs> persuasive. My goodness. Well, I, uh, the title, I love the title. Um, it could be anything, I suppose, but it was interesting one word title. Uh, the blurb set the scene nicely. I'm very interested after that blurb. 
as an aside, Emily, good gracious, what a yeah. what a voice, what a reader. I know, I know. Uh, she could overthrow Matthew McConaughey as the next uh, uh, viral sleep app person. Wow. You know, I mean, I would. Does, to that. does yeah. he do that? Does he do viral sleep apps? Yeah, he does. It, there's this whole thing, that. Matthew. Really? Um, Oh, in that case, she could, she could knock him into a cocked hat, oh, okay. I think. <laughs> well, there yes. you go. Yes. He's, his days are numbered. Uh, so the, the book itself, wonderful descriptive prose once again. The dialogue, I thought, was cool. It kind of read like a, a really neat uh, uh, screenplay to me. It really felt uh, that kind of natural, wow. Wow. organic. Yeah, I enjoyed that. The bang is where I had a little bit of trouble. Um I just maybe needed the hook set up earlier. Towards the end, oh, there it was, and I enjoyed it. So hmm. probably reading into it, I'd love it even more. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, you are, of course, the the great favourite now of the Genius Room. They all want uh, you to be on every show from now till the end of eternity. Because <laughs> oh, you're so, you're so nice there. to everybody. Um, and Johnny says, come on, Steve, be a bit kinder. Ha! <laughs> so, uh, so just coming back to this... It's Royal Women in Fantasy Worlds, okay? Warrior Guard slash or Prostitute slash Courtesan. Uh, Pamela Jeff says, yeah, my thoughts, Jan, you said it better. And Vagabond says, yes, Jan, it drives me mental too. So, yes, there is, I would say, there's a definite issue there, actually, with, with fantasy and the role of women within the world. Um, so, just from my point of view, I think it's very smooth writing, David, very smooth writing, but I need, I need personally, I need more world building. A number of people have said what nice world building you, you did. I just need to be able to see this thing. I need you to slap me in the face of this world and make it sufficiently different for me to go, yeah, that is different, actually. I, can, I know who to, to, uh, to try and sell this to. So, number one, build the world. Number two, build the drama. Simple as that. Build the world, build the drama. But, you know, really fast. Get me, drop me right on the deep end and make me, oh, this is different and it's strong. I need to, to feel that if, if I'm to, to take it out and differentiate it sufficiently with publishers to get you lots of big bucks. Let's look at the numbers. 72. It's, it's a high-scoring show, mostly because Steve is on, actually. <gasps> what have I done? Exactly. He's a nice person. He shouldn't be. He shouldn't be on this show. He's a nice person. Oh, I um, know. Yeah. I will say. I wanted to say one more thing too. Is yeah, you can also, it. besides world building, though, you can focus on the character, which is something that I often go to uh, in a book. And so there were elements here where I thought that I was like getting to know the character, and especially they showed rather than told, which always drives oh. me crazy in fantasy when they tell you. But the part about her getting into fights was a nice glimpse of her personality, and it, it yes. slowly was rolling that way. And so I'll keep reading if the character's interesting, even if, you know, is maybe not as pulling because that, that's yes. really what gets me. So I, I think that is a third option. You know, that yeah, work. absolutely. Very good point. Yep. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's look at the numbers. It's tight at the top there, isn't it? Wow. But we do have a winner. I know you're with us now. I think you may put yourself a, a quiet inner glow of satisfaction. Hmm? Who knows? You could be the month's winner, actually, because that's 73 and that could be unassailable. So you're going to have to watch every show now until the end of the month, I'm afraid. I just want to ask... I want to ask Steve. Oh, your first time yes, on, sir. Steve. Is the last... Oh, I will do it any time you want. This is Oh, really? Great oh, they don't always yeah. say that. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> so you've been on stages all over the world. You've, you've played yeah. trombone. I mean, I, there's lots of things I haven't. You, I mean, we could just talk and talk and talk for hours. You played with, I, I, I've got a very slight connection here, okay, but you don't know about this. But uh. you were for, the former soloist and writer for Maynard Ferguson. Right, who was right. very well known um, band leader, I believe, and he worked. He mm. was part of Stan Kenton's band, 
a long time ago now. He was initially. He was. Right, when he was quite and young. And Stan yeah. Kenton's daughter, Leslie Kenton, was uh, in the same sort of authorial flock as, as Peggy and I when we were both being published by uh, Random House. Wow. Uh, we, we write the same sort of book. So that's how I know about Stan Kenton. So we've got a very slight connection there. But you've performed on stages all over the world um, and soloed and everything. So how nerve-wracking was that compared to this? Oh, that's a really good point. Anytime I do something that I have not much expertise at, the the app in my head starts going off. You really don't know what you're talking about. You should be nervous. Uh, so I was definitely nervous with this and did a lot of homework and, uh, you know, tried my best. Uh, yeah, this was more nerve wracking than uh, I played once a Berlin Jazz Festival that was a multi-country hookup that reached millions. And um, I was not nervous for that at all because, uh -huh. yeah, I know I can play my high notes and it'll be good. Yes. But, uh, yeah, this this was a little scary, but I liked well, it a lot. I've just asked the genius room and they told that 100%. They've given you 100%. You've voted, you've voted lots of 100%. So they voted you 100%. <laughs> we want you back, Steve. We definitely want you back, Ben. You're going to come back? Anytime. Yes. Anytime. Fantastic. Brilliant. And we want you back too, please. This time, next Sunday.